We are glad that you're here today. We want to focus today on a sermon we've entitled Investing in an Eternal Foundation. Investing in an Eternal Foundation. Our primary text is 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 15, and you're welcome to turn in your Bible on your device, uh, whatever you may have that you can select the Word of God. Our scripture and text comes from 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 15. Psalms 127.1 reminds us that except the Lord build the house, you labor in vain that build it. Romans 14.12 tells us, so then each of us will give an account of himself or herself to God. We want to focus on that text, the importance of the Lord building the church and the fact that without his help, we will not be able to stand before him and give an account as a faithful steward. Uh, I think we have a video clip to remind us of foundation. And uh, Sean, I think you'll like this if we're able to play that. The importance of a good foundation. And welcome again to 330. You Tell built it. the fort on sand, Dan. The foundation is everything. Don't keep pushing that. You're going to break it. Ah! I can fix that. <laughs> Skit guys remind us that uh, our foundation is everything. And that is true spiritually. Uh, are we building upon Christ? And so in our text today, we'll share uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Uh, I know that sometimes this is a popular passage amongst pastors. At other times, it's not one that is always preached on very often, but I think it is very needed in our time and day and as believers, we need to be reminded that everything we do, we will give an account to God. Notice uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 15, I'm reading from the ESV today. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God given to me like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw. Each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he or she will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he or she will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only 
as through fire. Today we want to focus on a subject I've entitled Investing in Eternal Foundation. Investing in Eternal Foundation. And see the title on the screen. Uh, our primary text is 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 15. The next slide we see our three main points today. Uh, and I like threes. I like three points. And today you had the symmetry of five verses, five more verses, and five more verses uh, in chapter three, one through five, a context of carnality, uh, a careful consideration, verses six through 10, and a Christ centered construction or foundation, verses 11 through 15. And so as we think about the context of our passage, this is Paul writing to the church in Corinth. And uh, he is challenging the church in Corinth as we read in our first verses. He says in verse 1, I wanted to address you as spiritual people, but I am having to address you as infants or children or babies in Christ. I fed you, he says in verse 2, with milk, not solid food. But you're still not ready. Why is Paul so strong about his admonition to those in Corinth concerning their lack of spiritual understanding? They had a pragmatic theology. And many today and so many churches do as well. They think if we have a lot of people and a program's working, God is blessing it. But there are many churches, I'm afraid, that are not building their foundation on Christ. We see televangelists, we read, we observe numerous churches of varying denominations, and many of these that are declaring their version, interpretation of the gospel, seem to think that they're all going to heaven. Have you ever heard anyone say, don't judge me, only God can judge me? You're exactly right, sir, ma'am. God is the only one that can judge anyone. Why? Because he knows the motive of the heart. Understand, as Paul's addressing the church of Corinth, it's not because they were not sincere. They were, he calls them believers, but they were babies in Christ. They did not understand and have the strength as mature adults, as mature believers. Herschel Ford, the scholar, writes, the city of Corinth was a commercial center. It was the sports center of the ancient world. Boxing, foot races, track, disc discus throwing, many other games and sports were indulged in by thousands of people in the city of Corinth. Gambling flourished. Well, they just made it legal in North Carolina to sports bet, right? I have high school students. <laughs> I hear them. And so uh, this was the, the context of Corinth. Venus was the goddess of love and was worshipped by the Corinthians. Aphrodite, Apollo, and Octavio were gods and goddesses within the Corinthian temples. Sodom and Gomorrah, according to one scholar, was at its worst, was no worse than Corinth. Sailors came from the west bringing very wicked, vile customs. Traders from the east did the same to Corinth. One author and scholar said, quote, The Roman Empire was rotten in the first century, yet all of Rome looked down on Corinth as a place of the greatest evil, end of quote. So corrupt was Corinth that it was actually made into a verb. To be Corinthianized meant to be morally corrupt to an extreme. The German author Linsky writes that Corinth was a more wicked city than the larger cities of the Roman Empire at any point in history at this time in the first century. G. Campbell Morgan wrote of the city of Corinth, quote, It was proverbial for its debauchery. Men and women of the time when desiring to describe utter corruption said, People live like those that live in Corinth, end of quote. Some would uh, use the analogy of Las Vegas today. Sometimes it's called Sin City. Corinth was known for this. Wycliffe organization 
in their historical geography estimates that Corinth had approximately over half a million in population and 70% in the first century that lived in Corinth were slaves. Corinth was a wicked, immoral, and idolatrous place. This mix of immorality and religion was similar to the Baal worship of the Old Testament times. It's in that context that Paul's addressing these believers in Corinth at the church there, at the churches in Corinth, and is reminding them, first of all, of this context of carnality. Jerry Falwell said years ago before he passed away that we need Christians and believers to be involved in our society because if we withdraw, it will get even worse. And there's a challenge there as Daniel stood in an ancient Babylon uh, palace, yet he stood up for what was right in the midst of corruption. And Paul here is addressing these believers in the church because many times the church is influenced by the world. The church is influenced by the world. And so God delights in using the foolish things to bring glory to himself. And how is that going to happen here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3? Notice in verse 2, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you're not ready. Verse 3, you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human or carnal or fleshly way? And then he gives an analogy. Paul understood. he gotten feedback from the people in the church in court. Some were saying, I follow Paul. Others were saying, I follow Apollos. And yet, in some translations, even other groups were being followed. And so, when Paul says that you need to quit being caught up in following your own desires, your own passion, your own uh, quest, he is reminding them of the problem of carnality that comes into churches when we begin to follow human leadership and interpretation instead of delighting in the study of God's Word. If you get in the Word, the Word will get in you. In verse 5, Paul concludes this context of carnality. He says, what then is Apollos? So why is he admonishing them and reprimanding them for following after and arguing and debating about what human leader to follow? He says, who's Apollos? Well, we know who Apollos here is. Who's Apollos, by the way? He was the first to congratulate the Wolfpack for winning last night as a UNC Chapel Hill student. So proud of you, Apollos. He's a good man. I don't know if I could have done the same. I would have been too frustrated from losing. Apollos, we know who Apollos Lee is. Paul is saying, who is Apollos? We know from historical study of biblical teaching that Apollos was one of the leaders, a great orator and teacher of God's Word. He says in verse 5, what or who is Paul? Interesting since he's the one writing this to the church of Corinth. He, he gives him an answer at the end of verse 5, servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. In this context of carnality, of jealousy, of strife, of debate, of discussion, of frustration in the church of Corinth. Paul is trying to remind them that all believers and all servants of God are nothing in comparison to the perfect Jesus the Christ. He is, as we'll see, the foundation and cornerstone. And if he is lifted up, he will draw all people to himself. But if we lift up others and their interpretation above Christ... This is the true definition of idolatry. Notice in this context of carnality, Paul is reminding them that we are simply servants. Notice in verses 6 through 10 now, a careful consideration. Paul begins to challenge them to think this through. Verse 6, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth or the increase Bottom line is, there are many people that are a part of contributing to the salvation and discipleship of believers that will one day praise Jesus forever in heaven. We're all a part of that. 
Whether you're a pastor or an elder or a deacon or a missionary or church planner, if you are a part of planting seed, if you're a part of encouraging and watering that seed, then God is the one that gives the increase. Recently, I was asked to speak at Sanderson High School this coming Friday at the Equity Program. To me, it's a great honor to speak at a program that emphasizes helping the disadvantaged. And you see how important it is in our lives that we practice real humility. This is a careful consideration. Some people, as believers, can go their whole life doing what they think is right, and it could come to pass, according to Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians 3, that at the day of judgment, the beam of seed of Christ, everything they've done will be burned up because it was done in a selfish and ulterior motive. Notice verse 6, he says, I planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase of growth. Verse 7, so neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. All praise to God. Verse 8, he who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. Verse 9, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. Everyone is important in the family of God. In building God's church, it is not just pastors. It is not just church planners. It is not just missionary. It is not just denominational leaders. Everyone is important in the family of God to do their part. The UK-born American poet Edgar Guest wrote these words, quote, Leave church work only to ministers, and soon the church will die. Laymen have their business, but they also have the training of their children. I wonder how it would be if there were no churches around, and people had to raise their children in a godless atmosphere. It is the church's important function to uphold the finer things, to teach that way of living from which all that's noble springs. But the pastor can't do it single-handed and alone, for the laymen of the country are the church's building stones. When you see a church that's empty, it's not the church that's dying. It's the workers that have failed to obey God's word. It's not just by song or sermon that the church's work is done. It's the laymen of the country who, for God, must carry on. Interesting words from a poet from the UK as he reminds people, as Paul did, that God's work is done by God's people. It needs to be done without carnality, without building on the wrong foundation. And so notice in verse 10, he points out this important, careful consideration. According to the grace of God, 1 Corinthians 3.10, God given to me, uh, grace of God given to me like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Notice the way the ESV puts it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. NLT says, Whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful. Why is it important to, to carefully consider one's motives? As I said, you can do the right thing for the wrong reason. You can do the right thing at the wrong time for the wrong reason. It's important as Christians that we understand it, it's a, we need to do what's right. We need to be humanitarians. But the grace of God working through us is more important than any good works. We are imperfect, Paul said. None are righteous, no, not one. There is none that is good. We are all sinful in our depravity. We have to have God's grace working through us. Paul put it this way, Christ in me, working through me. Not me, not my glory, not my pride. Not my building, but God's building, God's church. God delights in using the foolish things, Paul said in another passage, to bring glory to himself. Max Lucado points out that when God really works through submitted people, natural people begin doing supernatural things for God's glory. 
normal people began doing paranormal things, as it were, for God's glory. The average Joe Fisherman becomes an apostle. A despised IRS collector becomes a dedicated disciple. Notice here in verse 10, God's grace working given to me like a skilled master builder. I lay a foundation, others build upon it. Let us each be careful and considerate how we build on that. A small act of kindness can make a big difference. Jackie Robinson was the first black baseball player to play in Major League Baseball. As he was attempting to break the baseball's color barrier, sometimes he faced jeering crowds in the stadiums. While playing one day in his home stadium in Brooklyn, New York, Jackie Robinson committed an error. His own fans began to mock and ridicule him. He stood there at second base, humiliated, while the fans made fun of him. Then shortstop Pee Wee Reese came over and stood beside Jackie. He put his arm around him and faced the crowd. The fans grew quiet. Robinson later said that Pee Wee Reese's arm around his shoulder saved his career. An act of kindness that is God-motivated out of empathy and compassion, out of a foundation of trusting in Christ, can make all the difference. Notice in verse 11, we now see our third and final point that a Christ-centered construction is necessary. The foundation of what we do must be motivated by Christ. Verse 11, For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest. For the day, in the ASV, the word day is capitalized. You notice that? NLT says, on judgment day. There is a great day coming. Not just in Revelation, the great white throne judgment, but there is a great day coming, a beam of seat judgment for believers. And Paul says, if you build on gold, silver, precious stones versus wood, hay, straw, there's coming a day, judgment day, when it will be disclosed. Verse 13, it will be revealed by fire, symbolic of God's judgment, holiness, and purity. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he or she will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he or she will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as and through fire. These are really challenging words. As you notice in the last verse, verse 15, there is the truth that Paul is saying that the person who builds the church that does the work for God on the wrong foundation is not necessarily caused to die by Christ in their physical life. There is the weeds and the tares, the tares and the way that they grow up together, God allows it in his sovereignty. And yet there's a time coming when those of us who are believers are challenged to understand God's word, that if our motivation is not pure and righteous, if what we're doing is not proper and ethical according to God's teaching, then it will all be burned up. I know there's people who say as believers, I, I don't really care as long as I'm in heaven, I don't, I don't need any rewards. I'm not so sure that you'll have that attitude on the day of judgment. I understand what people say, and I understand people think that only what counts for Christ will last according to the words of the song. I'd kind of like to rephrase that theologically. It's not just, though it's a beautiful song, only what's done for Christ will last. It's only what's done through Christ and his grace through you that will last. That's what Paul is telling the people here. He is telling them, reminding them, whatever you're doing, if Christ is not behind it, if prayer is not behind it, if God's word is not rightly divided and taught, there's coming a payday someday. A famous head coach's football team was scheduled to play their rival that Saturday. 
Coaches searched all week for something inspirational to say to fire up his team. It was almost time to play the big championship game. The coach went to the locker room, was about to address his players. But as he walked in, he noticed standing by the locker room was a stray dog. They had named this stray dog Ringer. He had kind of become the informal mascot of the team. The football players there had become very fond of Ringer. Ringer had entered another dog's turf the day before and gotten his ear cut. His hair was missing. He had some dry blood around his eyes. And so the football coach picked old Ringer up, put on his angry game face, ran into the locker room. He set Ringer down on a training table where all the players could see, and with a quiver in his voice, he said, Men, I don't know how to tell you this, but those sorry players you're about to play, look what they did to our dog, old Ringer. Needless to say, Coach T's team played as never before and won that game. That story is supposed to be true. Well, sometimes players may be motivated by things that are not true. They won the game, but when it comes to internal investments, it's not just winning the game. It's as one guy said, it's how you play the game. And so as we conclude our message today, notice verse 15. If anyone's work is burned up, they'll suffer loss. But they'll be saved only as by fire. In Lyle Schaefer's book, uh, Shaler's book, he writes, Growing Plans, quote, despite a plethora of creative ideas and programs, the best single approach to winning people to Christ still is the old-fashioned system of personal visitation, end of quote. I believe that is true. In fact, a Christ-centered construction or foundation is necessary for God to truly bless some may say that you're blessed in this life. We are. There are people that do not even know Christ out of his sovereign providence that are also blessed. But what matters to me as a believer and a minister of the gospel is that one day I can stand before God and know that I did it his way, not my way. That my motives were to encourage people to accept Christ to be followers and disciples of the Word of God, to study, to show themselves approved, to build on the foundation of Christ, and to seek to do that which pleases Him. One of the most influential scholars of the Christian faith going back to the fourth century, long before the Reformation, was a young man who was a rebel. His mother, Monica, was a godly praying woman. This fellow often laughed at his mom's faith and defied her continual pleading for him to repent of his pagan lifestyle, convert to Christ. One day a minister noticed her prayer and cries and asked her why she was so upset. She told him of his wayward son, but the bishop assured her, go in peace as you live. It cannot be that the son of these tears should perish. Augustine ignored his mom's warnings again and again. But he could not continue and escape her uh, prayers. She prayed and wept for her son for 30 years until Augustine, sometimes alluded to as St. Augustine, surrendered his life to Christ. Prayer is powerful, and it's the proper and right foundation for all believers. Prayer and God's Word. Allowing God to receive the glory through Christ who is to be lifted up and preeminent in our lives. Dear Father, as we close in prayer today, we are reminded in your word that all that we do will one day be brought before your judgment. And you will have the final say for all people. Regardless of how talented or skilled or intelligent we think we are, without Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God, the righteous judge. We have no authority. We thank you that in several weeks, many believers will celebrate resurrection because our authority is based upon Christ who died, was buried, and resurrected on the third day. And this is the Lord's day, his day, because of his resurrection. We thank you, dear Father, for this opportunity to share 
the truth of your word. We know that it's important in our lives to lift up Christ, to build a solid foundation upon the word of God, upon the truth of God's word, upon motivations that are truly blessed and pure in your eyes. So help us, Lord, to please you and to put you first in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our group is going to come, our team's going to come and close us with our response song.